When people think of the Crusades, they normally think of the first four Crusades, and that sort of forms their image of what this movement was all about. However, there actually were a lot of Crusades, and these things continued for quite a long time. Now, um, part of the reason why I'm making this video is not because of some sort of popular demand, but rather because I don't really think that there are any decent um, accounts of these out on the internet, at least ones that are free from any kind of heavy, over-the-top religious bias. So I'm going to try to give a brief overview of all of these various crusades and give you a sort of general ballpark understanding of what's going on. So let's get started. First up is the Albigensian Crusade. This actually occurred in a nominally Christian area of a nominally Christian kingdom. What happens is the church authorizes the use of military force against the Cathars of southern France, and this goes on for 20 years between 1209 and 1229. Um, the Cathars are a religious movement. They are broadly speaking Christian, but they have a very different theology from what the Catholic Church was teaching. And this movement had been around for a while. They originated in the 12th century, and they lasted all the way until the 14th century, which means that they did manage to survive this crusade, albeit in much reduced numbers and with a lot less um, openness. Now, this crusade succeeded, but that shouldn't be too surprising given that they basically invaded an area and fought a bunch of civilians. Um, there was a rebellion in 1216, and I think that ran until about 1225, and that actually involved fighting, but for the most part, this was more or less a precedent for the Inquisition, and the Inquisition in many ways was formed to root out the Cathars um, later on in 1234 after this crusade had ended. Previously in my video on the Second Crusade, I talked about the Windish Crusade, which was sort of an offshoot of the Second Crusade, and that is where we had um, northern crusaders from the Holy Roman Empire and from Denmark going and you know spreading Christianity by force at the expense of their pagan neighbors. Well, this tradition will be carried on for many years, mostly at the um, urging of the Holy Roman Empire, Poland, Denmark, and Sweden. Now, also, Norway will get involved as well, but Norway often gets involved in the Crusades of the South as well. Anyway, um, so what this does is it ends up conquering and converting pagan areas like Prussia and Lithuania, Livonia, Estonia, you know, all the countries of the Baltic. I mean, Prussia is not one of the countries of the Baltic, but the other three are. Um, and there actually was an order of knights founded to deal with this war, and that was the Teutonic Order, which is much more long-lasting and powerful than the Knights Templar, despite the fact that the Knights Templar have gained a much stronger hold on the modern imagination. The Teutonic Order was way more powerful, way more corrupt, and way more influential in the long run. Um, and this is basically a semi-independent part of the Holy Roman Empire that was founded in 1190 and I think technically has not been dissolved, which doesn't make sense, but it's apparently true. Um, now, the Holy, uh, not the Holy Roman Empire, that had been anachronistic since its outset, but the Teutonic Order had become an anachronistic by the 15th century since all the areas around it were already Christian. And they were mostly Catholic Christian as well, so there was really no reason for this thing to exist. And at that point, it began to alienate and provoke its neighbors like Poland and Livonia, and it began to lose ground. And um, But not before it tried to convert other Christians to what it saw as the correct form of Christianity. The Fourth Crusade against the Orthodox Byzantine Empire is often seen as a one-off fluke. However, since it was followed up within five years by the Albigensian Crusade, meaning that we have two crusades in a row against other Christians. This means that um, this precedent is established by this time in the 13th century, and it is um, acceptable to attack non-Catholic Christians if you're doing so in the name of the papacy and you're looking for you know, absolution from your sins. The Pope is willing to grant that because it extends his power. Again, the number one priority of the Pope in the Middle Ages is to expand his power, period. All right, so the Pope approved of launching attacks from the Teutonic area into 
the Orthodox Russian republics of Piskov and Novgorod. Um, this is in a context, also keep in mind, where Novgorod and Sweden are fighting over Finland. So religion is sort of a sideshow, but it's still a factor. And, um, you know, no doubt Sweden played up the savagery of Novgorod and they tried to then get other Catholics interested in fighting them. That was a way that they could have a better chance of taking Finland, after all. Um, however, this crusade was not successful. Um, Novgorod would go on to become one of the key centers of Russian civilization, and its greatest leader, Alexander Nevsky, was in command on the day that the um, Novgorodians fought their decisive battle against the Teutonic Knights, the battle on the ice, where apparently there was a frozen lake and both sides literally fought on this frozen lake. Um, the Novgorodians were successful, and after this, the Teutonic Knights were no longer able to expand eastward, and they were forced to stick to their own territory and try to engage in predatory practices against the Polish and other neighbors who um, they could take advantage of at times. So now we're back to the numbered crusades, and I'm not entirely sure what the criteria were for making a crusade a numbered crusade, but if I had to guess, I would think that it has something to do with the Pope has to call it before people start going, one, and then two, it has to occur in either the Near East or Egypt, somewhere within the general vicinity of Jerusalem. But again, this is my guess, I don't actually know what the rationale was. At any rate, the Fifth Crusade. So Pope Innocent III, who had called for the Fourth Crusade, uh, was still Crusade uh, hungry. He hadn't learned his lesson, so he decides to call another one. And this one will officially run from 1213 until 1221, although a lot of that time, as with many Crusades, was spent gathering forces. And actually, by the time that this thing got into action, Innocent had died in 1215. Um, now, originally, part of the delay is because the Kingdom of Georgia was set to participate. They were going to, you know, use their considerable force of knights, but as we learned recently in the Mongol video, um, Georgia's army was basically wiped out by the Mongols under Sabutai, who was on a recon mission, and then the Georgians challenged him and uh, paid the price. However, King Andrew II of Hungary was eager to go. And he arrives at Acre in 1217, and he manages to win some battles, but then he falls ill and goes home. Uh, so that was one part of the crusade. This is a secondary front. Obviously, he did not end up going to Egypt like the rest of the force did. So after he's at home, then we have the others arriving at Damieta in Egypt, which was a fortified seaport. And they managed to take this fortified tower by rigging up a special ship as a siege engine and that was a fairly unexpected victory so they have this you know new basically uh, bridgehead into Egypt and before Frederick II and the Holy Roman force got there the um, other crusaders under uh, I forget who's in charge it doesn't matter you know they march in and they go after Cairo but the thing is, they didn't understand Egypt very well, because if you know anything about Egypt, you know that there are certain months where you don't march because of the flooding of the Nile, which occurs on a very regular schedule. However, for whatever reason, the Crusaders didn't figure that out, and then they were trapped by the floodwaters and crocodiles, so the Sultan of the Ayyubids um, was able to negotiate their surrender, and they were on the way, on packing up and leaving the uh, Demedia, Damieta, there we go, Damieta, when Frederick II actually arrived with his force. So he wasn't happy because he was bringing considerable reinforcements, and uh, the Sultan really got away with a fast one because had uh, the Crusaders not gotten caught by the, uh, the Nile and then Frederick had arrived with his army, they would have been in some serious problems. But as it was, uh, the Sultan got really, really lucky, and this guy is the nephew of Saladin, by the way. The Sixth Crusade, I think, could be the most interesting of them all. Or at least, it has to be very close to the top of the heap. So what happens is, as we remember Frederick II from the Fifth Crusade, he wasn't quite able to 
land and participate in the Fifth Crusade because of the other crusaders making an agreement with the Sultan. So he was still under obligation to do a crusade, and the Pope hammered him over this relentlessly. And this is in a larger context where there is a secular disagreement between the Pope and the Emperor uh, that the Pope is trying to make religious because he has excommunicated Frederick and called him an Antichrist and some other stuff. So Frederick has limited prestige in Europe at this time because the Pope is making life difficult. So he finally decides to launch his own crusade in 1228, and he arrives in 1229, and he goes to Acre, and he's sailing along the coast. Well, he didn't really have too many men that he could bring with him because he had to be prepared for war, and uh, he knew that there were um, papal armies in Italy looking to pounce on him. Uh, I think a lot of it had to do with he was trying to unify the crown of the Holy Roman Empire with the crown of Sicily or... Anyway, it's something that the Pope was angry about that had nothing to do with religion. So, basically, uh, Frederick doesn't have enough men to take Jerusalem by force. So, what he does is he just makes a show of force by sailing his troops up and down the coast and making it look like he has a big army. Luckily for him, Sultan al Kamil also has his own problems. So, the two of them negotiate. And they come up with a treaty that's very favorable to Frederick and buys plenty of time for the Sultan as well. And this agreement, um, among other things, restores Jerusalem. It restores some other areas like Jaffa to Christian control. And it allows for a 10-year truce. The one thing that they both agreed on was expelling the Jews. So uh, it seems like no matter what happens uh, when it comes to Christian Muslim affairs, somehow the Jews always get the short end of the stick. It's a pattern. Okay, so obviously this is a pretty great victory, even if it wasn't very traditional. But the excommunication stood, and the Pope had to pretend like um, Frederick hadn't done his duty, even though he had taken back Jerusalem where, you know, so many others had failed in the past. Uh, but anyway, eventually Gregory the VI the Ninth will be forced to lift the excommunication, but only because... He invades Frederick's territory in Italy, and then Frederick arrives and defeats him soundly on the battlefield. So, obviously, you know, a battlefield defeat is a sign, I guess. So, yeah, good for Frederick. He got off the naughty list. The 10-year truce was set to expire in 1239, and that directly leads to the Barons' Crusade. Now, ironically, the person who took advantage of Frederick II's truce was Pope Gregory IX, his bitter, lifelong rival. So, Gregory starts calling for men to be ready to crusade as early as 1234, and by 1239, there are plenty of people who are eager and willing to take part in this crusade. Um, the, there are two distinct phases to the Barons' Crusade, one of which involves no barons. Uh, the first phase is led by King Theobald of Navarre, and this launches in 1239. He arrives fairly early. Um, he did quite a bit of the fighting, actually probably the majority, but then he left early, and then the English contingent arrived and took over, and they were under the command of Richard, the Earl of Cornwall, who was the son of the last English king and the brother of the current English king. So fairly well-connected noble as far as nobles go. And, uh, you know, he was there from 1239 all the way until 1241. Territorially speaking, this crusade actually gained more ground than any other unless you count, like, the Fourth Crusade, um, which, you know, obviously took ground from the Byzantines. But next to the First Crusade, this was the second most successful if you're just looking at a map. Um, there also was a small side front that Pope Gregory tried to create at the last minute to try to help the Latin Empire. As I said earlier, when we're talking about Russia, um, you know, by now the Catholics in Western Europe were kind of okay with waging a holy war against other Christians, so long as they weren't uh, Catholic. Anyway, um, that doesn't really pan out too well. Most of the um, focus is here in the Middle East. Now, in 
1244, all of these gains end up being wiped away when Khwarazmian troops swept through the area. They had been hired by the local sultans, and they ended up destroying Jerusalem. And the reason why the Khwarazmians are there, if you'll recall when we talked about the Mongols, is because the Khwarazmians had had their empire destroyed by the Mongols about 20 years before. And at this point, there you know, are wandering bands of homeless Khwarazmians looking for work. And uh, here's where they found it. So, uh, Richard has an interesting career. In 1257, he is actually elected as the King of the Romans, which meant that he was almost the Holy Roman Empire. The problem was he couldn't get the Pope of his time to crown him. And he lives for about another 15 or 20 years. It never pans out, and he never actually does get to be Holy Roman Emperor, but he came really close. So, uh, he also participated in putting down a major peasant revolt and did some other stuff. He's a pretty interesting guy, but he never quite made it to being a monarch. The Seventh Crusade was a complete catastrophe, and for that reason it is probably the best known of the Crusades after the Fourth. So, um, this was led by King Louis the Ninth of France between 1248 and 1254. Louis at home was a very successful monarch, but his crusading record is a little less uh, endearing. Now, he has studied the Fifth Crusade in great depth, and he had looked into all the mistakes that his predecessors had made, and he was determined to avoid all of them. So he made elaborate preparations, spent tons and tons of money, um, and really just studied the thing to death. And he somehow still managed to fail and fell a lot worse than his predecessors had. So he arrives with 15,000 men in 1249-50 to and he still manages to get himself trapped and his army is more or less completely destroyed. He himself manages to get away and he gets to Acre and he still has his treasury intact so he spends money until he runs out and then he's recalled home because his mom is ill. Um, he also uh, puts in money and forms an agreement where the French will maintain a garrison at Acre until 14, uh, in 1291 at the expense of the French crown. So France will now be in permanent crusade mode, at least in some minimal way. Um, and because of his crusading activities, Louis IX is often called Saint Louis. He is actually the only French monarch to be sainted. And the city of St. Louis is also named after him. So while Louis IX is best known for the Seventh Crusade, he also had another crusade, the Eighth. Now in 1270, Louis was getting up there in age and his health wasn't the best. He was already 55 years old and he decided to launch another crusade. His nobles and members of his court tried to dissuade him from one, doing it, and two, leading it, but Louis was determined. And the reason why he was so determined is because at this time the Mamluks had come to power in Egypt and they were on the verge of overrunning Outremer altogether. Um, things were pretty dire in the Middle East. Uh, the King of Aragon had tried to put an expedition together, but that had basically been torn up by a storm and that had never gotten anywhere. So. After really thinking it out, Louis decides to work with his brother, the King of Sicily, so that the two of them could combine their forces and attack Tunis in North Africa. It seems like Louis had some idea that this was an important base of power for the Mamluks. However, really at this point, because the Mamluks were fairly new and had focused so heavily on Egypt and uh, the Near East, they didn't really have much connection to Tunisia, so this wasn't really all that bright of an idea. And it gets a little dumber when you realize that Louis thought that the current ruler of Tunisia was a guy, or I guess the governor of Tunis, whatever his title was at the time, uh, was some kind of guy who would be willing and able to convert to Christianity if he just had an armed following. Uh, well, that then ended up happening. So Louis and his army, along with the King of Navarre, land in 1270 in July, and they begin laying siege of Tunis. However, uh, this area is prone to disease, and a disease broke out in camp, and in August, Louis and many others died, 
And in October, there was a peace treaty where basically all, the only thing that Tunis gave up was the right for Christians to come into Tunis and trade and for Christian monks to hang out in the city. So, much ado about nothing. So as the members of the 8th Crusade at Tunis were packing their bags and about to head out, Prince Edward sailed up, and he figured out that there was nothing left to do in Tunis, so he moved on to the Near East. And he had a fairly small but competent army under him, and they landed Acre in 1271, and he'll remain for about a year. Now, he doesn't have many troops, as I mentioned, and the states of Outrimmer have really been getting hammered by the Mamluks, so Edward is forced to rely on his wits, and it turns out that Prince Edward was a fairly smart guy. He sends a message to the Mongols and gets them to cooperate, and then the Mongols strike the Mamluks from behind and help to avenge one of their earlier losses um, at the hands of the Mamluks, one of the very, very, very few losses that the Mongols suffered in open battles during the 13th century. And uh, so, as that pressure is being relieved, Edward is then able to strike out and win some small battles himself. So, that's pretty good for him. And the thing is, though, he can't really follow up most of his victories because he simply doesn't have the manpower and the lords of Outrimmer are simply unmotivated and disunited. Later, in 1272, he'll decide to call it quits and he will withdraw. And on the way home, he gets word that his father, Henry III, has died, and that makes him King Edward I, later known as Longshanks, with the sobriquet Hammer of the Scots. He'll rule from 1272 to 1304. And in many ways, he's kind of a second Richard the Lionheart, except that he's probably less uh, prickly and difficult to get along with. Although, uh, he did expel the Jews from England in 1290, and he earned the nickname Hammer of the Scots, which you normally don't do by being a choir boy. There is also a subspecies of crusade that was specific to Eastern Europe, and these went on long after Westerners had stopped going on crusades. And these were mainly directed against the expansion of the Ottomans. The most famous of these crusades, and I think the last, or very close to the last, was the Crusade of Varna, which occurred between 1443 and 1444. And this was a crusade which was aimed at driving the Ottomans completely out of Europe. Now by this time, the Ottomans had been established in Europe for a while. The Byzantines still existed, but they basically were the mayors of Constantinople, and then some random stuff in Greece. Uh, the, the Ottomans, by this point, were the strongest power in Europe, or at least in uh, the Balkans, let's put it that way. So what happens is we have a grand coalition of Christian lords who rally to the banner. We have the King of Poland, the King of Hungary, the Voivode of Wallachia, and the Duke of Burgundy, of all people. Um, and if, you, if you're familiar with these dates, you know that the Hundred Years' War between France and England is going on. So why in the hell is the Duke of Burgundy out here fighting Ottomans? Well, the Duke of Burgundy was Philip the Good, who in 1430 had arrested and executed Joan of Arc, the um, hero of the French cause. Uh, he was a traitor, to be sure, and he had worked openly with the English in the past. So the fact that he would deprive the French king once again of his forces by taking them east to fight a war that didn't concern him Shouldn't come as any surprise. Anyway, all these guys were in charge of this grand international expedition. Uh, the crusade managed to win some early minor battles, and they were fighting in the vicinity of places like Adrianople and Thessalonica, so they had penetrated into what was quickly becoming one of the key centers of Ottoman power. But then at Varna, they were crushed in 1444, and their forces were scattered to the winds and heavily demoralized. Later on, there is a second battle of Kosovo, where one of the Ottoman sultans will die in battle, but not before he completely crushes his opposition in the area. And after this, the Christian forces in the area are very much demoralized, and they will not really prove to be much help in 1453, 
when the Ottoman Sultan Mehmed II decides to try to assault Constantinople. The only people who help, ironically, are the Venetian, Genoese, and Florentine merchants who have been exploiting the hell out of the Byzantines for centuries at this point. But we'll talk more about the fall of Byzantium in due time. Earlier I mentioned that the Voivode of Wallachia was one of the key members of the Crusade of Varna, and that gentleman's name was Vlad II Dracul. Now, he had a son named Vlad, who became Vlad III, the Impaler, or as he's better known, Dracula. And Dracula simply means son of the dragon. Now, to give you a good idea of how awesome uh, Dracula's childhood was, when his dad had visited the Ottoman court at one point, his sons had been taken hostage, uh, Vlad and his brother. And then the dad had joined the Crusade of Varna. Now, the sons were hostages to ensure his good behavior, and he figured, yeah, you know, I'm basically consigning my sons to death, but this is important, so I'm going to go on a crusade. Well, the Ottomans didn't execute his sons, for whatever reason, and they were able to come home. But one of the sons, the other one actually really liked Ottoman life, and he became a court person for Mehmed II, and he was some sort of courtier. I don't know exactly what he did. Anyway... Vlad, though, had a lifelong hatred of the Ottomans, and apparently while he was in school at one of the Ottoman courts, he was uh, ostracized and didn't really succeed in making a lot of friends. So he has a big vendetta against the Ottomans for that and a number of other reasons, not to mention that the Ottomans like to interfere in dynastic politics in his homeland. Um, he became famous as the Impaler because when he came back from his first exile, because he was only in power very briefly in 1448 before his nobles overthrew him, and then when he came back several years later, he held a banquet to try to do a reconciliation, and that's what he told everybody. But when they got there, the nobles were rounded up with their families and they were impaled. And impalement involves being put on a tall stake and then having it slowly run through your body over the course of a couple weeks. So pretty terrible way to die, but it became Vlad's preferred method of dealing with his problems. Um, so after that, he's known as Vlad the Impaler, and later on he decides to spread his love of the Ottomans to the south, so he gathered his army and he began making war on the Ottomans in 1462, which seems to have been at odds with what his overlord, the King of Hungary, had wanted. And Vlad ends up killing tens of thousands of Ottoman soldiers and settlers. And as you might imagine, this really inspired the ire of the Ottoman ruler, Mehmed II, who had, you know, fairly recently conquered Constantinople. So he gathered a massive army, one of the most massive of his entire regime, to go after Vlad. And then Vlad is in exile for several years. He makes one final comeback in 1476. Uh, but it lasts for literally about a week. And then he is overthrown and murdered um, at the behest of someone who has money and troops from the Ottoman court. So anyway, that is the Crusades with a bonus of Dracula. And uh, obviously Bram Stoker probably read about this guy and some historical account, and then he just kind of liked the name, and then took the story and really embellished it, added some vampire stuff, so yeah, that's uh, anyway, that's the historical Dracula. You're welcome for the bonus. I work hard for you. <laughs>